Hi, my name is Kelly Murray. I am a clinical pharmacist at OSC Medical Center and a clinical associate professor in the Department of Emergency Medicine at OSC Center for Health Sciences. Um, today we'll be talking about hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine as part of um, a series of pharmacotherapy reviews for SARS-CoV-2. This presentation is up to date as of June the 8th of 2020. It's important to note that at present, no drug has been proven safe and effective for the treatment of COVID-19, nor are there any FDA approved drugs at this time. Always use clinician judgment and do your best to stay up to date on the literature as it is released. The overview today will be a discussion of the medications used for SARS-CoV-2, specifically hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine, as well as their proposed mechanisms of action. We'll then go through the literature that has been published and peer reviewed. We'll talk about the clinical trials that are still ongoing, as well as some uh, news information that has been released recently. Um, we'll talk about the safety considerations of the medication and then discuss who this medication can be used in. Hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine are both four aminoquinolines that have been FDA approved for malaria, lupus, and rheumatoid arthritis. The only difference between these two medications is the addition of a hydroxyl group on chloroquine molecule to make hydroxychloroquine. These medications have recently been approved through an emergency use authorization from the FDA, which is not to be confused with FDA approval. Um, however, the EUA authorizes adults and adolescents that are 50 kilos and over who are hospitalized with COVID-19 to be able to utilize hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine for the potential treatment of this condition. Anytime these medications are used in patients, they, uh, the healthcare provider as well as the patient should be reviewing and um, going through the fact sheets for the two medications. And within these fact sheets, you'll find information um, such as known risks as well as drug interactions. The proposed mechanisms of action for chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine is by inhibiting the viral entry and endocytosis um, at the host cell level. Um, so ideally, whenever this is inhibited, there's going to be a reduction in the viral infectivity um, through inhibiting the protein glycosylation and proteolytic maturation of those viral proteins. Um, at the same time, in addition to potentially stopping the spread of this um, in the host cell, we're hoping um, that some of the literature will shed some light on whether this medication can also help prevent SARS-CoV-2 um, in patients by reducing the release of pro-inflammatory cytokines and immune modulation. The studies that we're going to discuss today include um, the following that are on this trial, all of these have been peer-reviewed and published in the journals that are listed in green. The majority of these studies are hydroxychloroquine um, studies, and we have had a few that have been released um, fairly recently that we'll go through in a little bit more detail. I do want to point out at this point in the presentation that there was a study by Mayra and colleagues um, that was a multinational study evaluating data from the Surgisphere database. Um, that study has since been retracted by the editors of the Lancet as well as the study authors because the data um, showing that hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine increased mortality as well as um, caused problems like QT prolongation was ultimately a negative study. That data has since been unable to be replicated because the Surgisphere um, corporation was unable to release that information to a third party reviewer that could have um, helped uh, verify that that information shown in that study was correct. The first study we're going to talk about is the one that essentially started all of the fuss about hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. This was a study done in 36 patients where um, uh, the authors were looking prospectively and in an open label fashion and non-randomized fashion at patients who were taking neither of these medications, patients who were taking hydroxychloroquine by itself or hydroxychloroquine in the combination of azithromycin. Um, so they looked specifically at virologic clearance at day six. And as you can see, when there was a subgroup analysis done, um, the group that was taking hydroxychloroquine with azithromycin or six patients had 100% negative nasopharyngeal PCR. Um, and those that were taking hydroxychloroquine by itself also did pretty well compared with controls, where only 12.5% of the 16 patients received a negative nasopharyngeal PCR at day six. 
The authors were then led to conclude that hydroxychloroquine was associated with a viral load reduction and disappearance in COVID-19 patients, and that was reinforced when patients were taking the hydroxychloroquine with azithromycin. COVID-19 um, patients were then uh, suggested to be treated with this combination of medication to cure their infection and to limit the transmission. The Gotrit and colleagues group then continued on with their studies and will review uh, another study that they did um, and had released within the last month. The Molina study attempted to recreate the results that the Gotrit study did um, and they did so in a prospective and observational but uncontrolled fashion with the same combination of hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. Um, they looked at virologic clearance but also clinical outcomes um, and the treatment arms were similar in both of these study or in the Molina study compared to the Gotrit study. Out of the 11 patients that were reviewed, one patient died and eight out of the 10 patients that remained had positive nasopharyngeal swabs at day six. So this was in contrast to the results of the Gotrit study. One patient in this sample did have to discontinue therapy for QT prolongation. So the authors concluded that they found no evidence of a strong antiviral activity or clinical benefit when combining these two medications for hospitalized patients with severe COVID-19. The Borba study is otherwise known as the chloro-COVID-19 study. This was a parallel double-blind randomized uncontrolled intention to treat analysis looking at mortality at 28 days. They also were following adverse events and serious adverse events. Um, and they were looking at both a low-dose chloroquine group as well as a high-dose chloroquine group. They did have to, um, they did have to stop the, um, high dose chloroquine arm early because they ended up finding an increase in QTC prolongation in the high dose arm in 18.9% of patients compared to only 11.1% of patients in the low dose arm. And they also saw a trend toward higher fatality rates at day six showing 39% of patients in the high dose arm dying compared to 15% in the low dose arm. So the authors then went on to um, reconsent all of the patients that were in the high dose arm to determine if they wanted to be in the low dose arm. They re-enrolled those patients in the low dose arm and continued the study at that point. This study specifically is what led the NIH to include verbiage in their more recent update of the guidelines to avoid high doses of chloroquine and COVID-19. We're not sure how this translates to hydroxychloroquine at this point, but it does provide a bit more guidance as far as um, being cautious when using high doses or potentially even avoiding those high doses altogether. The next study we'll discuss is the Million study. Um, this is the remainder of the data from the Gotrit study where we're looking in a retrospective fashion at a cohort of patients who were prescribed hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. As a reminder, the majority of these patients were um, less severe in their initial presentation. And the results of this study showed that 91.7% of patients or close to 1,000 of the group showed good clinical outcomes, 4.3% showed poor clinical outcomes, and 4.4% um, at the end of the study showed persistent nasal carriage of the virus. There were eight, patient out of, eight patients out of uh, over 1,000 patients who died in the study as well. This led the authors to conclude that the administration of combination hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin before COVID-19 complications occurred is safe and associated with a very low fatality rate in patients. The Galeris study is an observational comparison of patients who took hydroxychloroquine to those that did not take hydroxychloroquine, and they looked at time from study baseline to death. Um, if a patient died after they were intubated, the primary endpoint was defined as the time of intubation. So in looking at these results, 811 patients or 58.9% took hydroxychloroquine and 32.3% of those were intubated or died at the time of study conclusion. 
that is compared to patients who did not take hydroxychloroquine or 41.1% of the total population, and only 14.9% of these patients were intubated or died at the end of the analysis. So as you can tell, there are a few different hazard ratios and confidence intervals listed in the results section of this trial. When comparing the crude analysis of these numbers, there was a uh, significant difference or increase in hazard when patients were taking hydroxychloroquine compared to those who were not. However, once the um, data points were adjusted for propensity scores and matched with other patients that were similar, these results were not statistically significant comparing the two groups. So this led the authors to conclude that hydroxychloroquine administration was not associated with a lower or increased risk of intubation or death. This does highlight, however, that we do need more randomized controlled trials to examine these treatments, considering this was an observational comparison study. The Rosenberg study looks at uh, patients who were um, in New York and um, receiving hydroxychloroquine, azithromycin, or a combination or one of these two medications separately. They primary, the primary endpoint was in-hospital mortality, and they looked at abnormal ECG results as well as cardiac arrest as well. So for the primary outcome, they used an adjusted Cox proportional hazards model, and it saw that in overall, in-hospital mortality was 20.3%. In unadjusted analyses, there were significant differences in in-hospital death um, observed across the hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. Hydroxychloroquine alone, azithromycin alone, and neither drug groups. Um, this was statistically significantly different with a p-value of 0.001. But when adjusted for demographics and specific hospital, as well as pre-existing conditions and illness severity, no significant differences in mortality were found when comparing the drug treatment arms to the no drug treatment arm as evidenced by the table and confidence intervals listed here. There was also no difference when comparing in-hospital death between hydroxychloroquine alone and azithromycin alone, but the comparison of hydroxychloroquine plus azithromycin versus hydroxychloroquine only or azithromycin only was not made. Regarding ECG changes, there were no significant differences between any of the three treatment arms when compared to no treatment, although the proportion of patients experiencing changes was higher in the combination therapy group compared to the others. The secondary outcome of cardiac arrest did show a statistically significant risk increase in the combination therapy group where 15.5% experienced an arrest compared to the group that took neither medication. This was statistically significantly different uh, compare, or uh, showing a confidence interval of 1.12 to 4.05. The authors then concluded that among patients hospitalized with COVID-19, treatment with hydroxychloroquine, azithromycin, or both was not associated with significantly lower in-hospital mortality. However, that cardiac arrest result uh, was concerning. The final study we'll talk about, um, uh, I'm sorry, um, the next study we'll talk about is the U study showing low dose hydroxychloroquine reducing fatality in the critically ill patient. This was a retrospective trial evaluating 568 critically ill patients for COVID-19 who all received basic therapy in addition to uh, potentially hydroxychloroquine or none. Um, 48 uh, patients also received hydroxychloroquine for seven to 10 days at a dose of 200 milligrams twice a day. The study included patients with severe acute respiratory distress and mechanical, mechanical ventilation. So we are looking at a much more sick population here than we did with the Gotrit study patients. The primary endpoint here is in hospital death, hospital stay time, as well as the IL-6 level. When looking at the outcomes here, um, the mortality in the hydroxychloroquine group was 18.8% compared to 45.8% in the no hydroxychloroquine group. This was statistically significantly lower in the treatment arm. The IL-6 level also showed an increase, I'm sorry, a decrease uh, or a statistically significant decrease in the hydroxychloroquine arm compared to uh, the no hydroxychloroquine arm. When the medication was removed from the patient's medication list, the IL-6 level bounced back up to baseline in the treatment arm. 
the authors concluded that hydroxychloroquine is associated with a decrease in mortality and should be prescribed for treatment of critically ill COVID-19 patients to save lives. The next study, we're going to switch gears a little bit. This is the Bulware study done out of the University of Minnesota looking at hydroxychloroquine for post-exposure prophylaxis. So this has been a, uh, a, a highly anticipated study that we had been waiting on for quite some time. It was a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial looking at 821 patients um, for the prevention of symptomatic infection after SARS-CoV-2 exposure. The treatment was a loading dose of hydroxychloroquine of 800 milligrams, then 600 milligrams in six to eight hours, followed by 600 milligrams daily for the remaining, remainder of the, four, of the five days. This was compared to placebo. The results showed that the majority of patients, or close to 90%, had a high-risk exposure. Um, however, the incidence of infection did not differ significantly between treatment and placebo groups. So when you're looking at the graphic on the right-hand side, you'll see that 13% of patients with these, risk, these exposures um, ended up seroconverting to positive for SARS-CoV-2. Um, the hydroxychloroquine group, or four, four, 414 patients, showed close to 12% um, ended up getting SARS-CoV-2 after the exposure, and 14.3% of the placebo group ended up getting SARS-CoV-2 after the exposure. So again, um, this was not a statistically significant um, difference between treatment arms and no treatment arms. There were no arrhythmias or deaths reported, so this is a good sign for this, uh, for this study. However, we just didn't see the efficacy that we were hoping for here. The National Institutes of Health have stayed firm with their recommendations. Um, so uh, this was last updated on May 12th of 2020 and has continued um, to current uh, June 8th. So at this time, there is still insufficient data to recommend either for or against using chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine for the treatment of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, SARS if chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine is used, it's recommended that the QT interval be evaluated and followed for toxicity concerns. The COVID-19 treatment panel recommends against using high-dose medications. Again, this is because of the chloro-COVID-19 study that we reported on. And the panel recommends against the use of hydroxychloroquine plus azithromycin, except in the context of a clinical trial. The Infectious Diseases Society of America have similar recommendations where they uh, have stayed firm since um, April 11th of 2020, recommending hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine in the context of a clinical trial, and hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine plus azithromycin only in the context of a clinical trial at this time. So the ongoing clinical trials with these medications are listed on the screen here for you. So we still have a few treatment trials that we're waiting on the results of, a few post-exposure prophylaxis trials, as well as the discovery trial. The solidarity trial was recently um, halted. Um, uh, this was paused because of the Mayra study that has since been um, retracted from the New England Journal of Medicine. On May the 13th, they decided to pause so they could do a, an interim safety analysis on the hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine arm of this trial. Um, but on June 3rd, the World Health Organization's Director General announced that based on the data reviewed regarding mortality, there is no reason to alter the trial protocol at this time, so all arms have been resumed. The Data Safety and Monitoring Co uh, Committee will continue to monitor this closely. The recovery trial, however, um, this was a, an international trial that was looking at um, evaluation of COVID-19 therapies similar uh, to the trial that we, uh, to the solidarity trial, and a request from the, U, uh, the UK Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency um, wanted to know whether uh, there was benefit seen with the hydroxychloroquine arm specifically. And they uh, released a report on June the 5th saying that there was no beneficial effect of hydroxychloroquine in patients hospitalized with COVID-19 and therefore they decided to stop enrolling participants to that arm of the recovery trial with immediate effect. The reason they did this was based on 1,542 patients versus 3,132 getting usual care. And they found no significant difference in 28-day mortality um, with a hazard ratio of 1.1 and a confidence interval that crossed one. 
this p-value was 0 0.1. This was uh, also um, reported that there was no evidence of beneficial effects on hospital stay duration or other outcomes either. So let's talk now about the safety considerations of hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine. There are a few drug interactions that need to be noted. So any patients who is taking digoxin when hydroxychloroquine is added to this medication, it's possible that that will increase the digoxin concentration, potentially causing toxicity. Patients on insulin and anti-diabetic drugs have an increased risk of hypoglycemia. QT prolonging agents, um, when added to hydroxychloroquine, can increase that risk of QT prolongation, potentially setting them up for ventricular arrhythmias or torsades. And drugs that lower the seizure threshold can also increase the risk of seizure when added to hydroxychloroquine. The safety concerns are listed on this screen. So um, patients who are hypersensitive to the medication have epilepsy or porphyria are contraindicated to hydroxychloroquine. And then any patient who has retinopathy, cardiomyopathy, an initial or congenital QT segment prolongation um, or drug caused QT segment prolongation um, may be warned against using hydroxychloroquine. Um, this medication can also cause renal and hepatic disease, hematologic effects, dermatologic effects, and has been cautioned against using in patients with G6PD deficiency. There are a few adverse effects that this medication can um, cause, and QT prolongation is the one that we'll talk about in the next slide. However, I do want to point out that the GI disturbances um, were seen and replicated in the trials that I've already discussed here previously, specifically nausea and diarrhea, as well as abdominal pain. The FDA and the ISMP have released safety alerts because of the risk of um, hydroxychloroquine and heart rhythm problems and QT prolongation. Specifically, um, the FDA released a statement on April the 24th saying that we shouldn't be using hydroxychloroquine or, or chloroquine outside of the hospital setting. Um, the ISMP released a similar result, but this one was a little bit different in that a patient was prescribed azithromycin. That azithromycin was discontinued when the patient was found to have a positive SARS-CoV-2. Hydroxychloroquine was started, but the patient went into cardiac arrest because the half-life of azithromycin is so long, it was still considered to be a drug interaction because there was enough azithromycin in the system to continue to prolong that QT interval. And then the Mercuro study has received a bit of attention here, um, where a cohort of 90 patients from Boston um, showed patients that were taking hydroxychloroquine were at risk of QT interval prolongation, especially when combining with azithromycin. Um, the additional additive risk factors of the Mercuro study showed that any patient who had a baseline QTC of 450 or greater or those on loop diuretics were more at risk. So when it comes to monitoring for safety, um, the University of Liverpool put out a drug interaction um, checker where you can evaluate the different COVID-19 potential therapies and how they interact with other medications. You can also look at CredibleMeds.org for a list of drugs that cause QT prolongation as well as what that risk is specifically. The ACC has endorsed the Tisdale scoring system for QT prolongation risk specifically for patients who have QT uh, prolongation or who are being started on medications for SARS-CoV-2. As you can see, you add up the different points for different risks that a patient may have, and then you classify based on what that total score is. So if a patient um, comes in with a baseline QTC of 450 or greater, that assigns them two points. If they're um, a heart failure patient, that assigns them three points. And then if they um, have a high risk score of 11 points or higher at the end of calculating that, uh, the ACC suggests um, a relative contraindication for outpatient use of hydroxychloroquine. So they say that uh, a score of 11 or higher should exclude somebody from getting hydroxychloroquine. So who should we use this medication in, if anyone at this point? 
Um, when it comes to treatment, hydroxychloroquine should only be used in the context of a clinical trial for treatment of SARS-CoV-2. This goes for chloroquine as well. Um, one of the clinicaltrials.gov um, identifiers is listed on the screen for you, and this is specifically the Novartis trial where patients can potentially be enrolled at OSU Medical Center for this. The post-exposure prophylaxis um, based on the Bolware study that was released out of the University of Minnesota. At this point, we still should not be using hydroxychloroquine for post-exposure prophylaxis because we did not see a result in positive efficacy for prevention of SARS-CoV-2 in those patients with those high-risk exposures. If a patient is started on hydroxychloroquine, whether it be in the hospital or outpatient, um, although it's not recommended in the outpatient at this time, we still need to be very vigilant and dutiful in uh, obtaining the baseline ECGs, obtaining an ECG four hours after the first dose, as well as a daily ECG thereafter to make sure that we're not causing an increase in QT. Um, uh, at this time. So make sure you can also discontinue all other QT prolonging agents to decrease that risk. Um, minimize continuous telemetry. Don't start the medication if the QT is over 500 and discontinue if there is an increase in PVCs or non-sustained polymorphic VTAC. At this time, there are more recommendations that you can find on other therapies of SARS-CoV-2, as well as hydroxychloroquine, um, which is updated daily in the OSU Medicine COVID-19 Guidelines or Handbook. And you can also see other educational videos on the treatment of SARS-CoV-2 at the link um, underneath or next to the second arrow. Thank you so much and check back as this presentation will be updated as more information is released.